Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I would especially like to thank the organizers of this uh, conference. This is a fantastic opportunity to get together and discuss these ideas. Um, I think I'd like to start with a short story, if I may. There once was a professor who gave the same talk, one of those professors who had achieved international recognition, and he gave the same talk two or three times a week and was awarded a driver and an honorarium. And finally, at one point, after about six months of this, he told the driver, I'm sick and tired of doing this. Why don't you give the talk? You've heard it enough times. And the driver said, okay, I think I can do that. So they show up at a conference. Perhaps it was Rome. Perhaps it was Milan. And the driver gives the talk perfectly. And the professor is sitting in the back of the room. And the first question comes up, and it is a difficult question, impossible to answer. And the driver says, well... That is such an obvious question. Even my driver sitting in the back of the room could answer that one. So with that in mind, I want to emphasize today that I am not an expert here on objectivism. I'm not a philosopher. In fact, I'm going to take the basic lessons of philosophy from objectivism from Ayn Rand and apply them to political economy. So if you want a more specialized take, if you want a more sophisticated version of the objectivist vision of metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics, there are other experts here at the conference. I'm going to apply those specifically to political economy. So I think we can start with the question, why does philosophy matter? Well, for a more sophisticated version, please see Ayn Rand and her magnificent essay entitled exactly that. Philosophy, who needs it? But I'm going to make the claim that if we look at the philosophy of Ayn Rand as expressed in two seminal essays, Man's Rights and the Nature of Government, and then look at the relationship between the Declaration of Independence and its philosophy on one hand, and then on the other hand, the American Constitution and its institutional implementation of the philosophical ideals of the Declaration of Independence, then honestly, we would not be in the trouble that we are in today. So I'm gonna talk about Rand, the Declaration, and the Constitution. Then I'm going to talk about some unintended consequences, and I will have to throw some economic theory at you. I am, after all, an economist. I'm going to look at the unintended consequences of government intervention in the economy specifically looking at two case studies. First, the financial crisis. And second, for lack of a better world, that morass that we have today, a combination of budget deficit, entitlements, and economic growth. So if we start, now I always tell my students, the first sin of PowerPoint is putting too much text on a slide. But occasionally one has to, as I am now, I'm quoting from Ayn Rand, this is from her 1963 essay, The Nature of Government. But I've highlighted things for you so you don't have to read too much. What are the proper functions of government? First, the police. To protect men from criminals, but also to protect our individual rights. Second, the armed services. To protect us from foreign attacks on our rights. And number three, the law courts. To settle disputes amongst ourselves in an objective fashion. Ties in with the Lockean argument, of course. Well, if you look at the American context, now of course, Ayn Rand did not literally write the American Declaration of Independence or the Constitution, but could have. I like to make the argument that the Declaration of Independence is a philosophical statement of principle, and then the Constitution itself is the institutional implementation of that principle. Rand herself liked to say about the American founding, and I quote, that the American system of checks and balances was an achievement. There were problems with it, I paraphrase, but quote, the incomparable achievement was the concept of a constitution as a means of limiting and restricting the power of government. So if we look at the Declaration of Independence, I have no power over you, there will be no exam, but I enjoin you, and you will thank me, to reread the Declaration of Independence this 4th of July. 
before you go out and have fun with friends, before you engage in civil society, which is a large part of what America is all about, read the Declaration of Independence. It'll take you about 10 minutes. It's beautiful language, and it's a reminder of the founding principles of this country. In fact, I reread it every year on the 4th of July. My friends, my friends think I'm weird, but then again, I'm sure a lot of us here have suffered from that same syndrome. So what is the purpose of government according to the Declaration of Independence? To secure rights. And what rights specifically? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So historically speaking, Ayn Rand did not write the Declaration Declaration of Independence, but we see here the parallels between Rand's theory of government on the one hand and Jefferson or the founding theory of government on the other hand. We have the purpose of government is to protect rights. So how are you going to do that? Well, with police, the military, and with the law courts. So we have a, a strong parallel between the two here. Moving from the statement of philosophy to the institutional implementation, we have the, the question then, well, why does the Constitution matter? It matters because it's based on sound principles. That's the first reason that the American Constitution still matters. It is based on a certain vision of the nature of government and a certain vision on the rights of individuals. And the second reason that the Constitution matters is that if there's no Constitution, anything goes. There's no more limit on anything that we do. Everything comes down to a matter of politics and a matter of political uh, will and a matter of obtaining a democratic majority. Principle has gone by the wayside at that point, and when principle goes by the wayside, rights also go by the wayside. So, what does the Constitution specifically allow the federal government to do? The key to the Constitution is to be found in Article 1, Section 8. I also enjoin all of you, again, there will be no quiz on this, but you should all carry a copy of the Constitution with you so that you can engage in debates and have people look at you weird and say, in a funny fashion and say, well, why are you referring to the Constitution if the American people want X? Well, just because we have a majority doesn't make it right. We have a constitution in this country to limit the excesses of a majority. Well, the important thing to remember is that the federal constitution is one of limited and enumerated powers. That is, according to the constitution, it's not a question of what the federal government's allowed to do except what the constitution says it can't do. No. According to the constitution, the federal government may not do anything at all except that which is specifically authorized by the constitution. So it is a constitution of enumerated and limited powers. That's something that seems to have been forgotten over the years. And if we look at a US jurisprudence, if we look at Supreme Court decisions, the court itself seems to have forgotten that the constitution is one of limited and enumerated powers. Keep that in mind. The constitution says that the federal government may not do anything at all except that which is authorized by the constitution. And there are enumerated powers, that is, a specific small number of powers. I've summarized them here for you into four different categories. There are first the military powers, so basically national defense, the powers of domestic tranquility. Keep in mind again, the Declaration of Independence. What does domestic tranquility have to do? Well, the protection of individual rights from chaos, from uh, bandits, et cetera. A few economic powers. This is where I say there's a little bit of a rift between the spirit of 76 and the spirit of the Constitution itself. But even then, if we look at what the federal government is doing today, these constitutionally authorized powers are rather limited. And then a few miscellaneous powers from uniformity um, of weights and standards and taxes and laws for naturalization, postal services, et cetera. But we basically have very few limited powers that are authorized to the federal government which is, of course, why we have such a federal, small federal government today and such small federal, wait, 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 no. What about commercial policy? What about corporate welfare? What about welfare in general? What about the fact that today, if you count the price of regulation, if you count indirect costs, the U.S. government is controlling about one half of all economic activity in this country. It's difficult to count. The federal government itself doesn't know how to count. And of course, that's intentional, I think, because it's easier to uh, get away with things if you don't put them on the books. It's like me saying, um, I'm entirely debt free, except for this $50,000 that I'm not really counting. And of course, it's thousands of dollars is chump change to the federal government. But we have this odd juxtaposition. On the one hand, we have limited and enumerated powers. On the other hand, we have a federal government today that is engaged in just about everything you can think of. So back to Rand, we have a problem today, and I particularly like this language, and this is why I emphasize the notion of enumerated powers. We have a moral and political inversion, writes Rand, in the nature of government. Instead of being a protector of man's rights, the government is becoming their most dangerous violator. And we have here in the last uh, paragraph that I highlighted, the stage where the government is free to do anything it pleases, 
while the citizens may act only by permission. Think back to the concept of enumerated and limited powers. So what did the Constitution do? The federal government may not do anything except that which is specifically authorized. What are we seeing today, as predicted by Rand already about 50 years ago? That the federal government is free to do anything it pleases. And in fact, now, the burden seems to be on those who would say, who have to find a reason why the federal government can't do something, as opposed to the burden being on the federal government to say, I have this authority under the Constitution. You have to have a little bit of theory. I am an economist, after all. You're not going to get away with this, so pull out your uh, pencils and rulers, and we're going to have a few graphs. No, just kidding. Um, this gentleman here, Ludwig von Mises, one of the founders of the Austrian School of Economics, talked about an intervention as a distortion of price signals. What do I mean by that? Well, basically, markets allow aggregation of information. When I go on my next road trip, I'm not going to call ExxonMobil to make sure that there's gas available every 200 miles. I'm not going to place a number of telephone calls to make sure that there exist Coca-Cola dispensers and that there exist hotels along the way, but rather the market is going to aggregate that information for me through the process of supply and demand with which we love to torture our students for months on end. And I see a few of you having bad nightmares here and recollections of your economics classes, but economics is fun. What the price mechanism does is it allows for information to go back and forth, basically for consumers to place orders to entrepreneurs and say, hey, serve us. In fact, I travel everywhere. I'm, I'm a humble professor, but everywhere I go, I have a traveling staff of about 50 or 100 people. Some of them grow food for me. Others bring it to wherever I am so that I can purchase it from them. Some people provide transportation. I am utterly incapable of digging oil out of the ground. I'm utterly incapable of refining that oil into gasoline. I'm utterly incapable of building a car or fixing it. And yet all these things are available to me thanks to the price mechanism through which the market can allow people to serve each other. But the problem, Mises points out, is that when we have an intervention in one market, that's going to send a distortion of that information into another market, which is going to break that other market, in a sense, throw it out of equilibrium, at which point there's going to be a call for further government intervention in that second distorted market. Well, then what's going to happen at that point? That intervention is going to distort the signals into a third market, and then, of course, there's going to be a call for government intervention in that third market, et cetera, et cetera. So Mises uses the example of milk. So let's say I am a benevolent government bureaucrat, and I look around and I see that milk is selling on the shelves for about $4 a gallon. Poor children cannot afford milk, and I want to help the poor children. So I'm going to pass a law that says it is illegal to sell milk for more than $2 a gallon. That way, poor children can have access to milk. Well, here's the problem. I'm now a dairy farmer. I love being able to switch hats very quickly. So I'm now a dairy farmer. And I realized that my input costs have all stayed the same. The vet bills are the same, the rent is the same, the insurance is the same, the cattle feed price is the same, the electricity, everything is the same. But my output sales price has just been cut by a factor of two. I can't keep up. So a lot of dairy farmers are going to go out of the market. They're going to drop out. They might sell their cows and go into some other sort of business, or maybe grow corn because that's subsidized. And they're going to try to find some way to be able to recuperate their losses, and many will drop out of the market with the upshot being that milk will disappear from the shelves, and we will have a shortage of milk. Well, that wasn't my intention. I was trying to help poor children, and now there's no milk available for anybody. So what do I do? Well, I go talk to the dairy industry. Maybe have a, a summit meeting in my offices at the, Secret at the Department of Agriculture, and I call in the representatives of the dairy industry, and I say, listen, we passed this law to help the poor children, and you guys stopped producing milk. What's going on? And the dairy industry says, well, it's not our fault. Our sales price was cut, and it's too expensive. You know, we're same, paying the same price for cattle feed and for electricity. I say, don't worry. I got this under control. I'm going to place a price control on cattle feed and cut the maximum price. And before you know it, now you chuckle for a second and say, well, this could never happen in the real world, right? Well, take for a second the example of healthcare in the United States. A few quick examples, and I could spend hours talking about this, but in the 19th century, we have a trade union that is formed, the American Medical Association, that restricts the supply. Basic economic tells us that a restricted supply means the price is going to go up. Then you have a number of different laws and regulations, all intended to help people that are all driving up the demand by giving more money to people to spend on health care services. You can think, for example, the fact in World War II, um, health insurance was linked to jobs. Why was that? Well, because of the wartime economy and to avoid inflation, wages were frozen, government intervention number one. 
You already had a shortage of labor because of the mobilization and the war effort, so how do employers attract people to work for them if they can't raise the wages? Well, you increase the benefits. So you give them health insurance. And then that gets locked into the tax code where uh, employers get certain benefits uh, by providing health insurance that individuals don't get when purchasing it. But what's the upshot of all that? You're increasing the demand for health insurance, which is going to raise the cost. Then you have a combination of Medicare and Medicaid, which are subsidies for health insurance to the poor population or the elderly population, which means what? An increase in demand, which is going to drive up the cost. Then you have the Affordable Care Act under President Bush, which is going to drive up the demand and therefore drive up the cost. You have a number of regulations that restrict supply, like the inability to sell insurance across state lines. President Obama comes in and says, oh, health insurance is too expensive. Well, guess what? You've had 150 years worth of government intervention driving up the prices. So what are we going to do to solve this? More government intervention. You got it. Well, I could wax philosophical as an economist and keep talking, um, but instead I'm going to read directly from Ayn Rand. Uh, in a, small pa a short passage from Atlas Shrugged, I can, when I was reading this uh, this morning in final preparation for the talk, I realized, why am I even bothering these poor people with my thoughts? I'm just going to open up Atlas Shrugged on a random page, read 10 pages, have Uncle Nikolai's story hour, entertain you with this, and then we move on. But I thought that might be a little bit of a cop-out. So I'm reading uh, to you a short selection from uh, Section 2, Chapter 5. The chapter is entitled Encou Account Overdrawn. And it's basically the culmination of a series of economic directives. I suspect everybody in this room has read Atlas Shrugged at least twice. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. But think about the numerous economic interventions, the directives that happen. You have the anti-monopoly, anti-consolidation, the doggy dog bill, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, there comes a point where um, there is a shortage of coal. And after giving a number of excuses, uh, Ken Daniger's cousin, who's now in charge, is giving an excuse after excuse after excuse about why he can't provide coal to the Taggart Railroad. And finally, he says, Miss Taggart was being unreasonable since it was only a matter of one day's delay. It was only one day's delay. It caused a three days delay in the run of freight train number 386, bound from California to New York with 59 carloads of lettuce and oranges. Freight train number 386 waited on sidings at coaling stations for the fuel that had not arrived. When the train reached New York, the lettuce and oranges had to be dumped into the East River. They had waited their turn too long in the freight houses of California. With the train schedules cut and the engines forbidden by directive to pull a train of more than 60 cars. Nobody but their friends and trade associates noticed that three orange growers in California went out of business, as well as two lettuce farmers in Imperial Valley. Nobody noticed the closing of a commission house in New York. Nobody noticed the cl closing of a commission house in New York, of a plumbing company to which the commission house owed money, of a lead pipe wholesaler who had supplied the plumbing company. Fast forward a little bit. Mr. Quinn, of the Quinn Ball Bearing Company, which had once moved from Connecticut to Colorado, waited a week for the freight train that carried his order of Reardon Steel. When the train arrived, the doors of the Quinn Ball Bearing Company's plant were closed. Nobody traced the closing of a motor company in Michigan that had waited for a shipment of ball bearings, its machinery idle, its workers on full pay, or the closing of a sawmill in Oregon that had waited for a new motor, or the closing of a lumber yard in Iowa left without supply, or the bankruptcy of a building contractor in Illinois who, failing to get his lumber in time, found his contracts canceled and the purchases of his home sent wander and the purchasers of his homes sent wandering off down snowswept roads in search of that which did not exist anywhere any longer. Intervention, cascade of consequences. So we have to ask the question. I often like to make the claim that Edmund Burke was a Hayekian in the same way we have to wonder if Rand was a Misesian or Mises was a Randian, and others in this room can talk about that history more. But I want to talk now about two case studies as I wrap up here. On the left, uh, we have the housing crisis, and on the right, we have the two stalwart statesmen who are guiding the ship of state through the perilous reefs of budget deficit and overexpansion of government. So let's look at the housing bubble for a moment and start off with monetary shenanigans. So if you go back to Article 1, Section 8, there is some talk about coining money and uh, regulating the value thereof. There certainly is not anything about the federal government having power to run the economy and determine by committee Yes, just about five, a five-minute drive from here is the Federal Reserve, otherwise known as a Politburo that determines the price of money. 
we have a number of fluctuations in the interest rate. This is the key interest rate that the Federal, um, the Federal Reserve sets. Now, it may not seem like that much of a fluctuation, but think about this the next time you try to borrow to buy a car to buy a house. The difference in your repayments between a 1% interest rate and a 6% interest rate and how much of a difference that makes on the macroeconomic level, the country as a whole, if money is available at 1% plus a little bit of a fee for the banks or at 6%. Now, one way of looking at this is that the economy was overheating with the dot-com bubble, so the Federal Reserve stepped in by raising interest rates in 2001 to slow down the economy. But then the economy slowed down a little bit too much, so the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates to get us out of the recession. And then the housing bubble uh, was getting out of control, so the Federal Reserve increased interest rates to slow the economy down and then lowered interest rates again. But there's another way of looking at this. The economy was overheating during the dot-com bubble because the Federal Reserve had lowered interest rates. So the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to slow the economy down. It worked. We got the recession of 2001, at which point the Federal Reserve lowered the interest rate to get us out of that recession. It worked. We got the housing bubble, at which point the Federal Reserve raised interest rates in 2006 to get us out of the housing uh, bubble causing a massive recession so that the Federal Reserve responded by doing what? You guessed it, lowering interest rates. Sense of pattern here? Um, parenthetically, there's another talk about this. I'm, in, um, I'm very worried about hyperinflation in the US right now. I don't see any other way. We've had uh, near zero nominal interest rates, which means after you factor in inflation, interest rates are actually negative. Um, and if we watch the pattern of what's going, been going on over the past 15 or 20 years, we've got a classic case of Austrian business cycles. The Federal Reserve, in fact, rather than being the hero that saved us from multiple recessions, I like to say as somebody, a pyromaniac, who starts a fire and then gets a medal for pulling the alarm and calling the fire department before anybody else does. It's a perverted system. Now, the question you may ask at this point is, okay, you have cheap money, but why did it go, why did it go into housing? Well, a little bit of theory here first, back to Mises and bad information. Imagine for a moment that I hire a leprechaun as a teaching assistant. Little do I know that my leprechaun is evil. So, I hire the leprechaun, I grade all my exams as a, at the beginning of the, the, say, the first month, and the average is pretty good, it's about a B average for the class, and I hand them to the leprechaun to return to students in recitation hour, and the leprechaun, because he's evil, decides to lie to all my students. And he says to everybody, you got 100% on the exam, congratulations. Now, my students, being rational economic actors who like to uh, maximize their utility at the margin, otherwise known as studying as little, bit, as, little as possible, uh, my students respond rationally to that information by cutting back on their studying. Clearly, they didn't need to study as much because they got 100%. Now they can spend a little more time working on the English class, perhaps, that they're failing, or spend a little more time on their social life. Second exam rolls around, I'm surprised to see that the average is a D. So I grade them, I hand them back to the leprechaun who gives them to my students and once again lies to all of them telling them that they got 100%. Students being rational, what do they do? They take this information into account and study a little bit less. By the end of the semester, everybody has failed the class. Were the students irrational? No, the students were rational, but they were acting on bad information. They responded rationally to bad information. Let me give you a second analogy here. Bear with me a little bit because it involves a magic school bus. And I stole this one shamelessly from Gene Callahan, who's got a book called Economics for Real People. Imagine for a moment that um, to supplement my income over the summer, as a professor, I decide that I'm going to drive a bus through a desert. Now, it's a particular circumstance because the desert is relatively long. And so there are no fueling stations in the desert. And so we have a choice of going fast through the desert at a relatively warm temperature or using up some gas for air conditioning and then going a little bit more slowly. So I canvass the passengers before I drive to ask them at what temperature they'd like to have the bus. And they all have individual thermostats in their seats that they can set. So I can then read the thermostat, find out what temperature they want. And if they want it particularly cool, I'll drive more slowly. And if they want it particularly warm, I'll drive a little bit faster so we can get to the destination. So all the passengers set up, uh, set the thermostats, et cetera. Now, unfortunately, the evil leprechaun who has been fired at this point for giving bad information to students creeps onto the bus and as an act of revenge against me, tinkers with all the thermostats and modifies them by five degrees. So I read all the information on the thermostats, which is off by five degrees calculate accordingly how fast I can go, zip along through the desert, and we run out of gas. Why? Was I acting irrationally? No, 
I was simply responding to the information that I thought was correct, and I ended up going too fast for the amount of air conditioning that was being used. Now, here's the analogy. The bus is the economy going through time. I, as the bus driver, am the entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, I'm reading the signals from the passengers, the consumers, about how much they want to consume now versus consume later. That is the trade-off that they want between speed and temperature, or in the real world, the trade-off that they want between consumption and savings. Unfortunately, the evil leprechaun is the Federal Reserve, which tinkers with the interest rates. Those interest rates that were set by the Federal Reserve were fake signals of the economy, fake signals of availability of funds, and they were thus fooling entrepreneurs into overinvesting, which means that the economy ran out of gas in the middle of the desert. That's the recession. So we go from the magic school bus to a lost bus in the middle of the desert. I have here a list of a number of agencies that help channel those easy funds into the housing market. For time considerations, I'm basically going to summarize this into the fact that the Federal Reserve basically invented the subprime loan and forced banks to make more subprime loans as a part of a drive to increase American home ownership. So you have banks that are being prosecuted for not making enough subprime loans, and there's no risk to the bank because as soon as they make the subprime loan, they can send it, sell it to Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae, which are private agencies, and make a lot of money as long as everything works, but as soon as there's a recession, the taxpayer takes them over. Again, rational responses to bad information. I could go on and on about this, but I want to talk about the second case study here. We had, so in conclusion, artificially cheap money, moral hazard, that is people protected from the consequences of their actions, and regulatory policy that made people uh, take bad decisions because they were responding rationally to bad information. Okay. Second case study, as you've noticed, I'm on a little bit of a Cole Porter kick these days. Fred Astaire here. Things have come to a pretty pass. Go back to the original um, purpose of the federal government. Go back to the Declaration of Independence. Go back to constitutionally authorized functions. And tell me how the federal government could come to the point where it is spending somewhere upwards of 40% of national production. Upwards of 40%. Now, Wayne Cruz of the Competitive Enterprise Institute recently estimated that regulation in the U.S. costs anywhere between an extra two and three trillion dollars in compliance costs. That's on top of the actual spending by the federal government. So even if it's just 40 percent, add on state expenditures, add on the cost of compliance, and we have a pretty ugly picture of what's going on here. We have runaway debt. Unfortunately, I can't keep my PowerPoints running as fast as the printing presses are running. Uh, and so we've reached the 100% mark where the federal government owes 100% of national production. We have a runaway entitlement program. Now, this is, a lot of this stuff is off the book, so it doesn't even count towards the debt. But without any uh, tax increases or additional deficits, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are set to overtake 100% um, of federal spending within uh, the next um, 30 years or so. This is where we stand right now. Now, here's a few silly solutions that have been proposed in politics. Now, they may sound silly unless you've lived in Washington, D.C. long enough. Here's one solution that politicians seem to favor. Ignore the problem. Second solution, class warfare. The rich need to pay their fair share. Now, it's true that the top 1% of American taxpayers are paying only 90% of income. Well, uh, raise taxes. Why don't we just tax the top 1% of Americans at 100%? Well, well, because there are economic reasons not to do that, not to mention moral reasons. Uh, raise taxes without cutting spending. It seems that um, a lot of the Washingtonian, Washington politicians these days are getting a lot of credit for cutting something like half of a percent, and a lot of others are increasing spending. Uh, here's a, a fifth solution. Increase spending and hope for the best. <laughs> It'll happen after the next election. And I would propose to return to the Constitution instead, and I will quote James Madison, who, when asked to sign a, um, a federal spending bill of basically an early welfare scheme, I think it was for the Charleston fire, he said, I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article of the Constitution, which granted a right to Congress of expending on objects of benevolence the money of their constituents. Now, of course, this type of rhetoric could have been spoken just last week by John Boehner or Barack Obama. No, I'm just kidding. But if we look at the breakdown here of federal spending, I have an alternate solution for you. And this solution involves going back to the philosophy of Ayn Rand and going back to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I'm feeling happy this afternoon because I love talking about these things, and you're a great audience. So I'm going to start with a generous interpretation of powers actually delegated and enumerated. 
So 24% of federal spending goes to defense. I'm going to assume for a second that that 24% actually is all defense spending, not other things, not offensive spending, not any public choice story. And we go through here the different spending. So I'm going to say generously that 38% of government spending today is authorized by the Constitution. Now, what is not authorized? Education, 4%, cut, gone. Healthcare, 24%, not in the Constitution, gone. Welfare, 11%, not in the Constitution, gone. Pensions, 23%, not in the Constitution, gone. I have just cut 62% of government spending simply by returning to the Constitution and solve the budget crisis. So, in conclusion, we have fundamentally a philosophical crisis. Yeah. Notice, no debate, no posturing. I just solved the budget crisis in one fell swoop. What we have here is fundamentally a philosophical crisis at the root of a political and economic crisis. I'm gonna borrow from Rand and philosophy who needs it in the last minute uh, of my talk here. Again, I encourage all of you to read this. We have a problem of metaphysics. People are no longer respected as individuals today. They're, in a, they're basically lumped in as members of groups. The rich, the this, the that, whatever coalition is able to secure funding um, through the public purse. We have an epistemological problem, the Austrian knowledge problem. If government intervenes in one area of the economy, it's going to distort, as Mises famously pointed out, and there's going to be a distortion because the federal government, as any central planner, simply does not have the requisite knowledge. We have an ethical problem. People are no longer individuals endowed with rights. People are now pawns that can be used as means rather than ends to fulfill the democratic process or to fulfill the whims of whoever's in power. We have a political problem because politics is still treated as romance, statesmen uh, who serve us, the political process serving the common good, et cetera, instead of coalitions and politics as exchange, or in fact, politics as plunder. If we look at uh, Frederick Bastiat's famous saying that the state is the great fiction through which everybody tries to live at the expense of everybody else. So in conclusion, the problems that we have today, problems of political economy, Mathematical problems of overspending, problems of politics, are fundamentally problems of philosophy that can be solved by going back to the U.S. Constitution, going back to the Declaration of Independence, going back to the philosophy of Ayn Rand. How we actually get there is a different story, but I will at least leave you with the principle. Thank you. Uh, for, my name is Andres. Excellent presentation. Uh, well, my question is uh, a little bit um, silly, let's say, because I understood this in one hour, and why do you think politicians don't understand this? <laughs> well, there are two answers to that. That's a great question, by the way. Um, and it depends. I have an answer before my morning tea and after my morning tea. Um, are politicians stupid or are they self-serving? I don't think they're stupid, unfortunately. I think politicians get this. But it's like, I'm gonna answer it with an analogy here. My students always ask me, because I run my macroeconomics classes as a comparative economics class. So we, we study the classical model, we study Keynes, and we study Hayek, basically. And then they always ask me, okay, this Keynes business absolutely doesn't make any sense. Are you gonna create wealth by taking it from one side of the economy and give it to another? Hayek makes a lot more sense, the knowledge problem, the flow of information. Uh, in fact, why are you assigning us this textbook? Just give us iPencil, which we'll read in five minutes, and then we'll be done with the class. And I say, okay, well, you're thinking like an economist, not like a politician. So two politicians stand up. And the first one says, I have a plan to fix the American economy. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. And in the process, I'm going to take money from the disorganized few and shower it upon the uh, disorganized many and shower it upon the organized few so you can vote for me. That's politician one. Politician two gets up and says, I suffer from a knowledge problem. I can't fix the economy. I'll let you fix it. Thank you. Who's going to win the votes? So my suspicion is that politicians know this entirely too well. They're playing political games. And it's a question of, uh, that's why I say it's a question of educating the electorate rather than the politicians. I suspect most politicians actually know this. Some may actually believe that you can create something out of nothing. Some may actually believe that. But I think they're too smart. And I think it's just a question of uh, robbing Peter to buy Paul's vote. Other questions, though? Uh, this isn't precisely a question, more of a comment and a suggestion. Uh, I certainly uh, agree with the, with the idea of trying to change the intellectual culture and, and reaching the shapers of opinion and so forth. That, 
in general, is a pretty long-term process. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you know, we've got a problem that has huge short and medium-term consequences. So I think it's, it's instructive for us to remember or learn that there have been some examples of significant rollbacks in the size and scope of government, usually when things reach a crisis point. Margaret Thatcher in, in being elected in 79 when the you know, UK was the sick man of Europe and radically changing things now, it's, a lot of it's been undone uh, since then, but for a while it really did shrink the scope of government, privatized uh, dozens and dozens of state-owned enterprises and so forth. New Zealand in the 1980s, socialist basket case, a labor government came in and deregulated, open to free trade, privatized, et cetera. A lot of, again, some of that's been reversed, but it made an enormous difference in, in changing things around and, and rolling back a lot of the state. Canada even uh, had a much larger government debt as a percentage of GDP 20 years ago and managed to somehow get that over the course of a decade or two way down. Sweden, likewise. Sweden is still a welfare state, but the size and scope, the, the percentage of, of GDP consumed by the government is at least 10% less today than it was 20 years ago. So there are some examples we can learn from. I have not tried to figure out a recipe for how to take the lessons from that and apply them to our specific situation. But that's a challenge there for academics and think tanks to work on, use those examples and try to draw from them. I largely agree with a caveat. Um, I agree there have been some stories like that. There's a fantastic story in the U.S. of telecommunications, trucking, and airline deregulation, which actually started, kudos to my profession, with economists in the 1960s pointing out that maybe there was a problem. Then they made their way into government, and then you had a strange coalition of Ted Kennedy on the one hand, who was, and Ralph Nader, who were worried that consumers were being hurt, and Gerald Ford and others who were worried that this was anti-free market, and they somehow worked together, and that's why we all have small telephones with enormous computing power in our pockets today. On the other hand, if you look at the lessons drawn from the current financial crisis, if you ask the average person on the street, I don't think you're ever going to get anybody say, well, the problem really was a combination of the Community Reinvestment Act and the recourse rule. Uh, instead, what lessons have people drawn? Unregulated capitalism. capitalism. What did we get? Two quasi-trillion dollar uh, bailouts. We got Dodd-Frank. And I'd like to say Dodd-Frank's a bad thing, but there are 400 reasons that I can't tell you why it's a bad thing, because 400 of the rules have not even been written by the independent agencies yet. Um, so I think it's a question of finding special opportunities and strange coalitions, because uh, the political process is so locked up with the duopoly, as you know, of the, of, it's not even a two-party system. I refer to them as the Republicrats at this point, and it's hard to see who's who. Um, what special opportunities can we get? And there is, I think, some good news from a liberty perspective over the past even five years, um, occasional court rulings, occasional ballot initiatives, et cetera. Um, I want to leave you on an optimistic note, so I'm going to say, yes, we can do this. Uh, but I recommend to you also that Leighton and Lopez book, because they look specifically at those instances where the leverage was found. Sir. One thing I really liked about your talk was that the student leprechaun story seemed to really show the distinction between a failure in knowledge and a failure in morality. And I like how you're sort of crediting people today mainly with a failure in knowledge because we have this assumption that the government knows what it's doing. But then again, with the increase in social media and information, at some point, it's no longer going to be a failure in knowledge. Do you anticipate that being something that's going to become evident to people, or what are the stumbling blocks to recognizing that it's no longer a failure of knowledge? I'm a little, I'm a Luddite, I have to admit that. Um, I have my suspicions about uh, social media, and I think we have a lot more inf raw information, but not necessarily the cognitive and epistemological framework to interpret it. And when I say we, I'm excluding pretty much everybody in this room, but people in general, um, you can have a lot of raw information about, say, where markets are going, but still not know that there's a difference between what economists would call the market rate of interest versus the natural rate of interest. Uh, still think that um, the Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates at a certain level, and that's just a reflection of what the interest rate is without seeing that there's going to be a distortion. Uh, so I think it's still important to emphasize education. Um, again, a terrifying essay by Rand, The Comparchicos. I'm not just dropping names. I'm sure you've read it. But The Comparchicos uh, essay by Rand, Rand about how children's minds are deformed from a very young age by the public education system and turning them into collectivists from a very young age. Um, I think the problem is even with all that raw information, people still tend to have uh, 
a, a, a failure of interpretation of that knowledge because it's a cognitive and epistemological story. Uh, I did underemphasize the moral story. I'm sure there were shady dealings by bankers, but my conclusion on all that is the market is a strong disciplinary force. Bankers, do I still have a minute or two? I have a minute. Okay. Bankers are traditionally a pretty boring lot. Uh, I used to tell the joke about the 36318 rule of banking. They take your money at 3%, they lend it back to you at 6%, and they leave at 3 o'clock to play 18 holes of golf. That used to be banking. I mean, think about it. You're running a business where the money that you're investing could be recalled at any moment by the person depositing it. Wow, that's a scary business. Banking traditionally has been a pretty... Um, um, so there were bad banks all along, but bad banks failed. What do we have now? Bad banks are not just encouraged to be bad. And I talked about the recourse rule earlier. Recourse rule was a rule by the Treasury Department that made it cheaper for banks in terms of capital requirements, in other words, um, idle resources, made it cheaper for banks to own mortgage-backed securities than it did for banks to own um, things like corporate securities because they were considered to be safer. Why were they safer? Because they were defined as safer. Um, and so the banks face that story. Um, I would love to see, and I don't know the jurisprudence of it, there may be a lawyer in the audience uh, who can talk about the notion of clawback. Instead of having banks bailed out after losing consumer money, I would like to see personal responsibility for the CEOs. Now the problem is, to what extent were the CEOs responsible when you had this whole regulatory apparatus, which would have made it irrational for them. John Allison, the former CEO of bb and tells a great story about how he was on the phone with his favorite neighborhood regulator um, who was trying to get him to accept TARP money. And John Allison said, well, we've run all the stress tests. We're fine. We don't need TARP money. And the regulator said, well, we haven't seen your, your stress test, but we can tell you one thing. If you don't take TARP money, we already know that your stress test will fail. So he was essentially forced to, to take that, and he was, I, I, this part I haven't uh, read in detail, but he was one of the 20, 25 bank CEOs who were in that closed room, that big closed room meeting with Han Paulson, Hank Paulson, who were essentially forced to comply with this. So to what extent is their CEO responsibility from a moral perspective where there is that huge regulatory apparatus that doesn't just distort information but offers the moral hazard, the bailout? I probably ought to explore that a little bit more, but I think moral education comes with cognitive education. The two are tied together, but that's a good point. Thank you. So uh, anyone else? Um, well, while we're waiting for somebody, maybe I'll take the moderator's uh, prerogative here, um, <laughs> since we've got time and no one else is standing up here. Um, I want to follow up on Bob Poole's uh, discussion of deregulation. Uh, we, we hear a lot of, whenever we hear the debate about debt and government spending and so forth, whether it's in Europe or the United States, it's usually presented as a dichotomy. Either the government has to cut a ton of services immediately and then the trash isn't going to get picked up, even though it should be privatized, of course, and uh, the, you know, police are going to not be on the street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or you have to get new revenue somehow and mm -hmm. steal from what few people are actually producing any wealth. And that's kind of the dichotomy. You kind of put your finger on something that I think hasn't been made enough of, and I want to hear your, uh, your perspective. Uh, uh, Wayne Cruz uh, c calculates that it might be 2 to $3 trillion regulations at cost. I remember 20 years ago, I think it was Murray Wiedenbaum, uh, some other economists were saying as much as 800 million to billion. This was 20 years ago, so that was actually real money back then. A billion it or not. here, a billion there. Pretty soon we're talking real yeah, money. What you, yeah, whatever. You know, but the point is, you have this incredible regulatory burden. Some of which is, and of course, all of it's come out for political reasons. Some of which is going to be very difficult to dislodge. But lots of it, like airline deregulation in the late 70s, et cetera, it's just such a burden that you would think uh, it would be a, in, in not, not an easy target, but a target where people who want to see less government could come along and say, look, economic growth is uh, one of the things that we can do, and the way you do that is to take an ax and go after some of the insane regulations. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on that? And there are any areas where you see, like airlines in the 1970s and so forth, where uh, here's an area of opportunity that if we really want to see free markets work, we should go after whatever it happens to be. I'm going to start with an indirect answer to that, because I don't know if it's the big area, but I'm throughout your comments, I was re reminded of the fantastic work that the Institute for Justice is doing. And that's a perfect um, example of instead of trying to 
eat the proverbial elephant in one fell swoop, the Institute for Justice is going in and protecting individuals whose rights have been violated. You may know, for example, that in the states of Louisiana and Alabama, it is illegal to sell flowers if one does not have a licensed and certified florist on staff. Now, we all know about the tragic accidents that happened with mismatched flowers. Um, <laughs> in the state of Virginia, across the bridge from here, in the state of Virginia, it is legal to teach yoga without a license. Thank goodness, free markets prevail in Virginia. It is, however, illegal to teach somebody how to teach yoga without a license. <laughs> and, and the list goes on. Um, so one thing I think that now you may think, okay, well, what's the percentage of GDP generated by flowers aside from Valentine's Day? And what's the percentage of GDP generated by yoga teachers? Not very much, but I think it's that kind of awareness on the other hand where if you talk to the average person on the street, you know, we have this three trillion, what's a trillion anyway? I love to have my students count up to a trillion. One, two, three, okay, that doesn't work. Let's count in millions, one million, two, okay, that's gonna take forever. Let's count in billions, is that one billion, two billion, three, that still takes too much time. So just to give them the concept of what a big number that is, people don't, I, I'm an economist, I don't know what a trillion is. It's, it's, it's a really big number. Um, on the other hand, people do know Okay, I wanted to start up a business. I saved money for 10 years. I got a second mortgage on the house. I skimped on vacations and helped my kids. I start this business and now they tell me that I can't do it because somebody else has the monopoly on this. That's something that people can understand. So in terms of the macroeconomic impact, I don't know and I'm, I'm thinking as we talk about something that could be the next big um, deregulated industry. In terms of the awareness, I think that type of little micro uh, victory that the Institute for Justice is doing is another way of looking at it. Maybe state-based initiatives on economic freedom. Um, the second thing, Russ Roberts, um, an economist who was at George Mason University, um, still is in the area, but he now works for the um, Hoover Institution, uh, Institute. Um, he never says if Social Security is privatized. He always says in conversation when Social Security is privatized. And I asked him about that, and he said, well, it will be, number one. It has to be. And then the second thing he says is, we're making a moral case here, we're making an economic case, we don't wanna shed doubt in people's minds when Social Security is privatized. And I wonder if at some point, when Social Security checks are completely deflated out of significance, um, if that's going to be a wake up call for some people, or at least, I think already the IRA and the Roth IRA are major victories in that direction. I always want to be an optimist. President Bush came along, talked about privatizing Social Security and failed. Okay, that's, that's the glass half empty. What's the glass half full? He brought the third rail of American politics into public discourse. That is a fantastic victory that took years of preparation by economists. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> as promulgated by think tanks. Um, I'm going to have to think on that question. That's a, I don't know where the next um, area of leverage is, and that's... Um, in fact, you just gave me my next paper idea, and I thank you for that. Um, I think it would be interesting to look at, or any students here who want to co-author a paper, I think this would be the next 10 items. Hi, my name is Diego, and I have a couple of questions, actually. Um, I was wondering, uh, when do you think this hyperinflation is going to happen? Because uh, since 2008, 2009, with all these bailouts of, of the U.S. government, uh, there has been a pretty stable uh, rate of inflation. So. Uh, when do you think it's going to happen? Uh, do you want, did you have another question also? Uh, yeah, oh, and the other both. question uh, is, well, you gave uh, an, an excellent solution to uh, starting to balance the budget. So uh, I was, <laughs> um, I mean, can you expand a little more on that? Like, uh, what are the solutions and, uh, for balancing the budget uh, do we have, or are we relying on on getting more education and and maybe the politicians making better decisions, or do we, can we find a, a better solution to that? The answer to the first question, um, when will hyperinflation hit? I can't give you a, a fixed date, but it seems to me when the banks start lending again. Banks are currently sitting on somewhere between a trillion and a half and two trillion dollars of unlent reserves for the simple fact that number one, they're getting um, interest from the Federal Reserve for holding on to that, and second of all, um, if you look at the backlash that happened, it's everybody's blaming the banks for what happened. Banks were making predatory loans. Uh, banks were taking advantage of people. Banks were lending too much. So now the backlash is we need to punish the banks. And as I mentioned, the Dodd-Frank Act um, gave regulatory agencies, some existing, some new, the authority to write up to about 400, 430 rules that have simply not been written yet. And the timeline, I think, is somewhere between the next two to five years that those rules will actually be promulgated. 
Um, I don't know when after that the hyperinflation will happen, but I'm pretty certain that it will not happen until then because banks don't want to be making big loans in an uncertain regulatory environment with so many new rules coming up. So that's the first thing. Um, watch Dodd-Frank. Once you watch that, watch what happens to the level of the reserves. And when those reserves starts going down, that's the floodgates opening, and I don't think the Fed's going to be able to hold it back. The second question, solution to balancing the budget. Um, my third book that I want to write <coughs> um, is Why the Constitution Matters, and I'll start with an op-ed simply saying, if you're for Obamacare, you're for torture. Now, it's a shocking title. That's how you get people's attention. <laughs> and I'm going to make the point that they're not moral equivalents, perhaps, but neither one is authorized in the Constitution. So that if you look at something just because you think it's expedient or you think it's good or you think you have a political majority for it but it's not authorized in the Constitution, that means the other guy, your opposition, can do that also. And I think that may be one way of educating people of saying, listen, if you do this unconstitutional thing, then the other guy has the, the power to do an unconstitutional thing also, and it all comes down to a democratic power game. Let's try to restrict ourselves and tie, tie our own hands with the use of the Constitution. That's the best I can think of in terms of educating people, but we've come so far from a constitutional ideal in this country that it's tough to know where to start with that. So, okay. let's keep working on it. Okay. Uh, any other and read more Rand. <laughs> yeah, uh, seeing none, I apologize running in and out. As conference director, I run in and out, and but I was uh, hearing the comments about how foolish people are to believe in Keynesianism, and I think Keynesianism is uh, erroneous too, but there are the fundamental problems of the, the variability of investment versus the relative constancy of saving and the open economy versus closed economy. Like the US has been on a Keynesian spending binge uh, and they can partly do that because the Chinese are willing to lend them money and they're willing to believe in the dollar and hold, and hold dollars and invest back in the US which keeps the exchange rate pretty steady um, and that works. Uh, it, it, it'll work for your economy. See, the, the problem is robbing Peter to pay Paul. So you can rob Peter's long term to pay Paul here now because Peter's in another country, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. And then there is the, the observed, you know, very big variability of investment versus constancy of saving, which changes the income flows at a given time. Uh, so I don't know if you have a comment about that. And that's, I think, why people think Keynesianism isn't idiotic. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, two, two quick comments on that. The first one is um, the Chinese investors who believe in the dollar, in the dollar are in for a, a big surprise, a nice surprise, because it's, it's, it's going to have to be devalued at some point. Um, the second thing is, um, I'm going to admit my own foolishness here, about two years ago I was really worried about the, uh, the dollar. Um, actually, uh, stuck at the Keynesian theory when um, I got my second uh, Bush uh, stimulus check. I think it was $400. <laughs> I didn't spend it and I didn't spend it in the US, I invested it in a Euro-denominated savings account. Ha, take that. <laughs> um, but more specifically, I was actually thinking of divesting from the dollar into the Euro because I was so worried about, this was 2008, 2009, I'm glad I didn't do that because then you get you know Greek bonds at 35% or so. Um, I can see why the Chinese would be investing in the dollar because the dollar is an awful currency in a world of even worse currencies. Um, people always ask, and I'll close with this, because I think it's related to your question. So if the dollar is going to tank and we're going to have hyperinflation, what's the next world currency going to be? Well, certainly not the euro. In fact, I think Europe is the canary in our economic coal mine because we've got about, when the European canary dies, we've got about 20 years um, to catch up. I don't see that it would be the yuan because that's still a state monopolized currency. Oh, wait, so is the dollar, never mind. Um, it's still a state monopolized currency. Uh, Switzerland has already taken action to um, uh, against inflationary um, against incre the increasing value of the Swiss franc. I don't know yet what the economy, uh, what the the currency would be. Some might say Bitcoin, but that still is kind of small and it's got its own problems. So. I think basically the Chinese are going to con continue investing, Chinese and other investors continue investing in the dollar, not a productive investment because it's investment in US government securities mostly, uh, but I think they're going to continue investing in there until some other viable alternative comes up. There was some talk, what, five, six years ago of OPEC countries switching to uh, selling oil in euros rather than dollars. I think they're pretty happy that they didn't, they didn't do that. I really don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's going to answer a lot of things for the US when world investors start ditching the dollar 
that's when we're, the chickens are going to come home to roost. So thank you for that comment. Okay. And thank you very much for an enlightening uh, uh, presentation. Yeah.